welcome to the last of uh, this year's Marshall lectures. Um, I'm not going to insult all the previous Marshall lectures, including me, by saying that we've saved the best until last. I'm just going to say that the last uh, will be pretty good. <laughs> you, have, you have spent last term and this term um, hearing from an extraordinary range of people who do everything from conventional entrepreneurial work, trying to get stuff done without owning or controlling the means to get it done, trying to find points of inflection in unjust systems in order to make them a bit juster. You've heard from people who spend other people's money trying to make things a little bit juster. And you've heard from people who spend their own money trying to make things a little bit more just. And in the course of that arc, across those two terms of lectures, in almost every session, someone has mentioned something about consciousness, something about framing, something about narrative power, something about empathy, and something about stories. Okay? It's been a fairly consistent theme of the last two terms. But it's a theme that we haven't, until this evening, uh, addressed really explicitly. So we thought we would give the last session in, the, in this year's Marshall Lectures to this idea about storytelling, about artistic communities, in this case, filmmaking, um, and its role in creating a juster system or a, a, a juster world. So, um, it's my enormous pleasure to welcome to the LSE Cara Mertes. You will have read her biography. She runs the Just Film Initiative at the Ford Foundation, which puts her absolutely at the heart of this global conversation about how artists, filmmakers, change the way we look at the world, change the way we feel about each other, change the nature of the conversation we have with each other and about the world. So we're going to hear quite a lot about that tonight. And one of the things that struck me as particularly interesting about this is that the community that Cara works with identifies as a community of artists. Sometimes they identify as activists, but always they identify as artists. And I think that connection as it were, between art and activism, <coughs> between stories and the world, might well sit underneath the conversation we have tonight. Um, as usual, the rules for the evening are very straightforward. The f roughly the first half of the evening will be spent in conversation between us. We hear from Kara. Kara shows us some films. Um, roughly halfway through, I will ask you to ask us um, questions. What am I going to say about the questions? Somebody shout out the answer. Make it a question. Yeah. <laughs> Form your question as a question. Um, start, thinking, start thinking now about what your brilliant question might be. So, welcome, Cara. Welcome to London. I know you... Welcome to the Marshall Institute. Welcome to the LSE. Um, the LSE, as you know, is a social science university. Um, this conversation is, an, is a radical departure for quite a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the students on a lot of the programs here. Um, for those of you in the LSE community um, for whom this world is a new world, start thinking about the work that Cara does as orchestrating data with soul. Cara. <laughs> I love that introduction. I'm going to ask if we can pull up the PowerPoint so that um, when I'm ready to go, we can just start, we can just start clicking. Is that You can click. Like I think you can, can click. Can I click? Yeah, I think you can click. We can just yeah. go. Nope. That's the other. We need to pull up uh, mine. But thank you all. Thank you all for coming. It's a real treat to be here in London. London is a kind of second city for me. There's a lot of chosen family here, a lot of second family here, and so it's really exciting to be here, and it's exciting to be sitting here with Stefan, who I know um, for many years, starting with the School World Forum, is where we actually met. 
Um, and I, w wanted to, um, I wanted to take you through an arc tonight and really touch on some of the ways that um, at Ford Foundation um, we are thinking about storytelling globally, we are working on these issues, but, but also some of the background, how we came into this and why it is that I think that narrative and visual storytelling, specifically moving image storytelling, is so important at this moment in the world. Um, how many people in here are actually consider themselves storytellers or filmmakers? How many people in here consider yourself creatives in some way or other? And how many people think that you're social entrepreneurs? And we're going to measure this against the first lecture where you asked people who felt they were social entrepreneurs. And so we have quite a few. So this is a really, really good mix. I think one of the things that, um, that we want to talk about here is why in the world we would be talking about film in the midst of a lecture series that's about philanthropy and social entrepreneurship. And I hope by the end of the evening you'll have a better sense of that. But to start off, I wanted to kind of go back to the beginnings. Um, uh, we, as humans, have been thinking about visual storytelling for a very long time. This is Lescaux in France. The caves, and I want you to look at them just a bit. Um, this is about 18,000 years old, as far as they can make out. Um, and this was humanity's, you know, that we found, first projection of sort of imagery around, and, and in fact, motion. It's really, really stunning these images. And so we've been developing story technologies for a long time. We'll zip right ahead to the 1800s. Um, and we've been thinking about how we can bring the outside world, pass it through our consciousness, and project it out uh, for many people to see at once. And so um, you all will remember this. Um, this is an 1896 clip of one of the very first films that was shown, and, and many people know the mythology of this being shown in a theater for the first time um, to a crowd probably like this, and people actually qu being quite worried that, that this thing was actually going to come off the screen because they'd never seen anything in motion like this on a large screen. Um, and so um, we are actually at a similar moment, I would argue, right now. This is a very light slide, but this is a this is an image from a new virtual reality film that was just launched at Sundance a week ago, where I just came from. It's called Awavena. Uh, and virtual reality, how many people are familiar with the term in the room? Some are, some aren't. So I'd say a little bit more than half the room. And people have experienced it in this room? A little bit, not so much. So virtual reality is a new uh, moving image story technology uh, that, that I believe actually is going to become a dominant in a way that we're going to experience. Um, visual storytelling, and we're just at the very, we're at, uh, I would say, if we can go back, I don't know if we'll click back, we don't click back, but we're at the same point, I believe, that we were in 1895 with 2D technology. We're now there with virtual reality. In other words, we're beginning to form languages, we're beginning to understand how it is that this kind of immersive story space is actually going to work, um, you know, in terms of our, um, in terms of uh, how we uh, form society. So, Stefan, I wanted to go back to one of the quotes that you brought up in the first lecture, which I love so much. The definition of entrepreneurship um, that, that you chose was Howard Stevenson's from, um, you know, Harvard Business School. Um, and you talk about entrepreneurship as the pursuit of opportunity beyond resources controlled, which I thought was actually a brilliant um, definition and one that, I, that Roger Martin doesn't use as much. It's not as commonly used as some of the other definitions of entrepreneurship. Um, and when I was uh, at Sundance, the, when I went there the very first year, I think it was 2013, um, 2014, uh, wait, 2006, 2007, I've forgotten my trajectory. Decades. But yeah. second, <laughs> the but second yeah. year that I was there, um, the Skoll Foundation had already started talks with Sundance. Um, but I kind of started thinking about this idea of entrepreneurship, and in particular social entrepreneurship, and I got very excited about this and started talking with uh, my colleague, our colleagues actually at the Skoll Foundation about this relationship between storytelling and social entrepreneurship. And as I tried to talk about this around Sundance, of course, I got a very big, well, why would, why should we talk about social entrepreneurs? There was absolutely no traction with the idea. Um, so I found that I had to kind of go back to my office and try and think again how I could explain to my community of cultural workers, my community of artists that I had come from and that I was now working surrounded by and make the case that social entrepreneurship in particular had something to do with what I felt the future of, of the narrative landscape or the storytelling landscape was. And I went to this, uh, this definition reminded me of that. 
this defines how I believe many documentary filmmakers work. They are actually in pursuit of opportunities in storytelling. They do not have the resources. They're constantly mobilizing other people's resources, whether their time, their talent, their money. And so what we started working on is how we could actually retrieve the definition of social entrepreneurship and bring it into a creative community and have it make some kind of sense. What we, you know, what we often experience is that there's a real rejection in the creative community of anything that smacks of market or business. And so it's really, it's been a, a, a kind of fine um, a knife's edge in a way, trying to bring this community to the community um, that I come from and have worked with. Um, and so what we did actually is developed this thing called Stories of Change about 10 years ago, which is still ongoing at Sundance Institute. Um, and just as a warning, we're gonna cue up the bending the art click in just a second. Stories of Change um, is something that came out of this belief that there was real resonance between um, the creative people that I was working with and the creative social entrepreneurs who were working to change the world. And this through line was justice um, and entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial nature. And you have uh, talked about the kind of qualities that you have to have as a social entrepreneur. You have to be risk taking, you have to think outside the box. You have to be living with a certain kind of urgency. In other words, there's a reason that you wanna do what you wanna do and you have to do it quickly. Um, whether that's transforming a certain kind of status quo um, in the marketplace or outside, or in the case of our storytellers, it's transforming a certain kind of social understanding or social reality. And so the theory was, our hope was, that if we could bring these two sectors together, we would actually be able to see them learning from each other and see them, in a way, co-creating from each other. And there were a couple of um, things that we had to keep in mind that aren't normally done. One is, we had to keep the creative, uh, pos the position of the creative people, the artists, the filmmakers, exactly at the same level as the social entrepreneurs. In other words, one couldn't be working for the other. Um, and that was very important. In other words, you bring your filmmaker into a space like the Skoll World Forum, which we started doing. We started creating convenings where social entrepreneurs would come and visit our space, Sundance Film Festival, and the filmmakers would go visit the space of the social entrepreneurs to begin to understand their language, to begin to dig deeper into what drove them, what were they after, and then how could they help each other. And so um, we started developing, we did a call, we found many, many stories about social entrepreneurs, which are very important. Um, and there, was a, there were four letters that I had put in the agreement that Sandy Hertz and I from the Skoll Foundation spent a lot of time talking about. I said that we had to not only tell stories about social entrepreneurs, we had to also tell stories about social entrepreneurship. And what that did is released you from having to tell um, autobiographies or biographical tales. In other words, you weren't locked into a single character and a single hero or heroine. You actually could talk about the values that are transformative in the world. And those four letters made a, made a huge difference in the trajectory of stories of change. And I'll just show you one example of one film that we funded, I think, about seven years ago. It was just finished this year. Um, and that tells you a little bit about how long both the filmmaking piece takes, it can take seven to 10 years to have an idea, to go from having the idea to actually releasing a film. And it can also take seven to 10 years for an initiative or an experiment like Stories of Change to start maturing and actually getting some traction in the world. So these, many people think cultural work is a short term, you know, you can get something quick out of it right away, you do a film quickly, you show people and you make the change. It's actually, I think, at its most successful, a long-term strategy. It can take five, 10, 15 years. Deep change, and we'll talk more about this kind of narrative change, um, you know, uh, this whole field that's emerging. But if you can play uh, Bending the Arc, this is a film that, that hasn't been released here, I understand, but it was just released in the US. I'm not going to be able to defect the jam dim, the jam dim, the jam defect. Et bien, celle ça a été fait pour moi, il était uniquement préparé tout testament. Je vous l'ai mis là-bas ici de l'hôpital Kanj. Le docteur Polo a dit non, je ne peux pas mourir. Je suis allé à Haïti en 1983. Je n'ai pas commencé l'école de school. J'ai rencontré les gens qui ont été mes meilleurs amis et co-workers. Je n'ai jamais vu une such abject misery dans ma vie. We started going house to house, and people were so sick. And I thought, how can we get this fixed? 
You and Paul were constantly going back and forth, and they would borrow things from some of the hospitals. I would put that medicine in these big suitcases. They usually thought I was a tourist. As soon as we opened the clinic doors, it was every possible disease you could imagine. She's dying. I think it's too late. This was life or death. Getting medicines down there was life or death. And everything was conspiring against us. The scientific community hated it. They said, it's not sustainable, it's silly, this could never be replicated. We could not administer the program because we don't have the doctors. In this script, we are uneducated, of course, stupid. If you've traveled to rural Africa, you know this. People do not know what watches and clocks are. None of our patients have died. One person died a few days after starting therapy because we started too late. It took us from being outsiders right into the middle of the debate. The results were dramatic and transformative. We decided this could be something like a movement. You are accountable to who? People I die in my brother. Rwanda is the most dramatic arc to a recovery. Threats of the deadly Ebola virus landing in the East African region. All borders are informed and screen anyone coming in Rwanda. Tout le monde c'est mon. Si moi même cap vivre je dis à me dire To me, this is about hope, and it's about rejecting despair and cynicism. So that is, that's an extraordinary film, and you can see the way that it positions the work of the entrepreneurs as they grew into their own vision over the course of years. But also, it's an incredibly artistic film, it's a creative film, and it's not the kind of film you could have commissioned. One of the reasons that you couldn't commission it is because Paul Farmer, for at least a decade, said he would absolutely not be involved in any film anytime with anybody. Um, but what the producer uh, did is continue to sort of shadow his work. Um, Corey Shepard Stern became friends with the three of them, actually, knew Jim Kim, Ophelia Dahl, and Paul Farmer. And she, she kind of tracked down archival footage that Paul didn't know existed. She would find things, and she um, knew enough about the work that he was doing in the current day, in the present day, to be able to have these incredibly informed conversations with him. Um, and we funded this film in the hopes that eventually Paul would come on board and he would see the reason why being um, in front of the camera would be important. Um, and he himself said, I don't have time to be in front of your camera. I have too much work to do. I'm, I'm changing the world. I'm <laughs> making healthcare a human right. Um, he didn't get the connection between putting it in one film so that there's a compact 90 minute experience which tells your entire story so that you don't have to continue telling it. He didn't quite understand the power of that. Um, and it was really Corey's dedication to the story and her building of trust with him and Ophelia um, and Jim over time that finally opened the doors to this story. It's not a thing that could have happened any other way. And so this is the, this is the kind of way in which we manage stories of change to both uphold and support somebody like that with her directors as they're moving through this very difficult process of building the story and also support the, the social entrepreneurs in their story in the way that they want to tell it. And these this building of trust um, this flowering of creativity, both on the, the side of the entrepreneurs, but also on the side of the directors. All of this takes an enormous amount of energy, focus, and time. I mean, just, just to add one little thing about Bending the Art. Do you remember, those of you who are here right at the very beginning of this series, we talked about what social entrepreneurship mm -hmm. might be. And exactly as Carla said, we talked about the yeah. Howard Stevenson definition. And what's extraordinary about Bending the Ark is that there were these people who didn't have any hospitals, they didn't have a network of public health visitors, they didn't have any medicine, they didn't have any money, they didn't have any political legitimacy, and they had the active hostility mm -hmm. of a system that was making things worse. Okay, so that's six things that were either against them or they didn't have. And out of this simple insight, which was a perceived malign equilibrium, okay, they built something that had all of those things, up to and including, a, what was it, a billion dollars? A billion dollars. A billion dollars of funding. Political legitimacy, funding, hospitals, extraordinary powerful network of public health visitors, medicines, 
they built that out of an insight into an unjust equilibrium, but without access to any of those things. And after the fact, it's very easy to say, oh, well, one of them is the president of the World Bank mm -hmm. and the other is the most pub famous public health um, thinker in the world, and the third is an enormously distinguished activist. You know. But that's after the fact. Before the fact, that's not true. Sorry, mm -hmm. I don't... I no, no, it's great. And that's exactly what the film tells you. I mean, it, it takes you from that journey to the beginnings of things where, where it is just an idea as, you know, that, and that's what we're working with. It's sort of part of our job or part of my job as, a, you know, kind of a field architect at this point is to pinpoint those moments where the beginning of an idea, actually you can see a trajectory to the end and you can see the impact and influence that it might have and placing your bets on those folks, whether those people have a track record or not. When Corey came to us um, seven years ago, she had some track record, but it wasn't a huge track record. I mean, a subsequent, I mean, she made many uh, films and wrote a lot of scripts in the seven years that she was raising money and trying to work through the process of making this film. But, but this is not just about experience, it's also about vision and it's about the transformative nature of the ideas, both on the creative side and on the entrepreneurial side. Can we have a screening at the LSE? Please? Yes, we can have a screening. I will get in touch with the filmmakers, but yes, we can have <laughs> Thank a, you. I think you need to have a screening at the LSE. But that's what brought me in contact with the Skoll World Forum community and the amazing work that was happening um, there uh, with you, Stefan, and being so struck by the innate creativity um, of the social entrepreneurs and a couple of lessons I just wanted to pull out from you, and then we'll move on to actually the subject of why we're here tonight, which is just films. Um, one lesson that I learned is that while the films are very important to make, um, extremely important to make, as we'll see with what happens with Bending the Ark and some of the other projects that have come out of it, um, Open Heart being one of them, is that as um, the, f the about function, making films about is very important, but what was even more important is that in the space of working together, the um, social entrepreneurs actually became more creative. And the filmmakers actually began to understand their entrepreneurial talents and skills and the need that they might have to grow and build and scale their ideas in a different way through their exposure to each other. That was a huge lesson. I had hoped that that would happen, but then when we began to see this happening, it was really very striking. Um, and then the second lesson I talked a little bit about, which is that these are not short-term processes. This is about human beings evolving, individuals evolving in their skills and their talents and their knowledge, and making room for the experiences of others to improve their own effectiveness, but finding strength and finding lessons from places that they didn't necessarily expect it. And we saw that again and again in our engagement, in particular with the social entrepreneurs, how struck I was that they were able to, with the smallest exposure, and this is partially because they're so brilliant and you know, ur urgent and creative and looking for any tool um, to move their agendas forward, but they were able to take on the um, power of narrative and storytelling really quickly with a fairly limited exposure to it. And that was something that was a real lesson learned. And so that's just two sectors coming together, right? And so social entrepreneurs are just one group of people who are highly uh, motivated, highly skilled, highly focused. They're all the things that we love about social entrepreneurs. And you know, I thought, what better place to actually bring filmmakers so that both of them can learn very quickly from each other. But that's just two sectors. Imagine if you actually brought filmmakers into a number of other spaces where people are thinking about issues in different ways. So urban planning, for instance, you could think about. <laughs> movement building, you could think about. So in certain ways, social Stories of Change was an experiment that led into some of the work that we're trying to experiment now um, with Just Films. Um, so what I wanted to do is jump a little bit to the history of, of what Just Films is and how we got here. So this is a lot of words. I'll give you the overview. I work right now at Ford Foundation. Ford Foundation is now the third biggest private philanthropy in the, in the US. Um, the Soros Open Society Foundations just jumped to number two, right, right below Gates Foundation. Um, but it's been uh, in operation since 1948. Uh, it has nine offices around the world. Its focus is uh, social justice issues, but specifically dismantling inequality in all of its forms. And it has long histories in movement building, uh, in education, in uh, free expression and creativity. Um, I think these are the biggest. Uh, I think these are the biggest areas: urban, you know, low-income housing, 
um, economic planning, and a global fellowship program, which put many lawyers and many uh, teachers and many educators through a fellowship through a fellowship program that ran until three years ago, and it ran for about 10 years. And so this was a hugely influential thing that Ford did as well. So Ford's trends in documentary film funding, it started in the 60s. Ford was already supporting experimental filmmakers, for instance. We, we found a very early fellowship where Kenneth Anger and James Blue were given uh, grants from the Ford Foundation, which if you know who they are, that's kind of striking that, that Ford Foundation would be giving them <laughs> grants. Um, uh, to experiment with, with film and to take their practice to a new level. So it was actually independent experimental film that it started and it moved to um, funding what they felt uh, would be content that would serve the new public media system that they were instrumental in forming. So Ford and Carnegie in the United States were instrumental in forming this thing for a public, public media. It was late in coming here in the UK um, you had your systems in place, you know, in the 20s and early 30s. We didn't in the U.S., uh, and it took a private philanthropy to actually put together the tiny educational uh, stations and system and create a public television system through a congressional mandate in 1968. I tell you all of that because these themes, these strands in this history actually runs through and, and plays out a little bit today. Uh, not a little bit, a lot. It informs a lot of what we're doing today. So you can imagine hundreds of millions of dollars going into the infrastructure in the US, the public television infrastructure. After that, there was a couple of decades where they were supporting public arts centers and spaces of exploration, so labs within public television stations. And that went on from the 70s through the mid 80s. Um, and a significant millions of dollars also went into this, um, you know, helping to train new generations of media makers. People like Nam June Pike went through uh, the TV lab at WNET. So I came in in the 80s um, and was the inheritor of a lot of this. It had ended, the funding had ended by the mid 80s. But what I ended up getting was a lot of phone calls, like we still want the TV lab, we still want, so what I, I felt was this enormous hunger and need for continuing infrastructure, which was not being supported either by government, well, government was the only support and it wasn't enough, but foundations were moving away from it. So that was a lesson learned very early in my career. Um, in the 90s, uh, Ford started supporting content um, in a big way, Eyes on the Prize, for some of you that remember that, um, was a TV series that told uh, the civil rights history in the US in a way that it had never been told before with African Americans at the helm. And that became the template for the way that Ford Foundation started funding documentaries primarily from then until now. Um, and so uh, when I came in, um, Orlando Bagwell had started Ford's uh, Just Films initiative. Um, I think you've probably read that. Uh, and he had started it as, a f as primarily a feature length film fund on the belief that you have to have these storytellers telling stories about people who are underrepresented, underheard, um, communities that are traditionally marginalized, communities that do not have access to the power that they need to control the conditions of their own life. So I'll come back to that theme of having power and how storytelling avails you of a certain kind of power in your own life and in a larger, uh, in a larger community. And that, you know, that, that question of power twinned with justice is the reason that we think storytelling is so important in this work um, against injustice. So when I came in, it was primarily funding long form documentary. And the question that I asked uh, is how do, we, how do we take what is essentially a fund designed for 20th century, 20th century realities as we're moving into the 21st century? How do we change it? What do we need to do in order to address this context which is changing rapidly? And I came four years ago, two years ago, you know, one year ago was a massive acceleration, but we've seen acceleration and change of context globally, both poli politically and technologically in the last four years in a way that nobody could have predicted. And so we're trying, you know, within the entire foundation to address that, but specifically in the moving image strategy, um, trying to think about ways of expanding and adjusting what it is that we do to um, actually, well, I'll, I'll talk about what we've decided to do. So this is where we've landed right now. This is the vision of Just Films, which is a content fund, which is integrated with a globally networked alliance of organizations, supporting the creative creation, distribution, and engagement strategies of 
independent movie image storytelling. I believe me, every single word in there we <laughs> argued over. Using independent when you're talking about global, um, using moving image instead of film. All of these things are, are looking forward to, to um, a future set of needs that we want to start addressing. Um, so where did we want to go? So what is Just Films really? I take you to this quote, Cornel West uh, was talking about Martin Luther King in this, and he says, justice is what love looks like when it is in public, and that's what I think Just Films actually is. Each of these stories is an act of love in the face of disempowerment, in the face of challenge, um, in the face of a real need for community to come together. So I think of, um, I think of Just Films as this sort of equal um, effort, thinking about justice and power together through storytelling, and that to me is the power of narrative. And you know, it isn't, it isn't this kind of love that, that is uh, sort of um, lacking in power. It's the kind of love that says we, there is an injustice there, we have to make a change. We have to, and I, we see it in our filmmakers, we have to tell this story because an entire country, an entire community, an entire population will continue to suffer if we don't tell this story. That's, um, that's what Just Films is trying to do. So um, this is what the global network now looks like. So uh, I've been at Just Films for four years, and just this year we've launched this. So you'll see this is a, a nice graphic that was developed for us, and on it you see the nine regions that Ford Foundation has offices in. And so I thought the best strategy to do would be to actually take the knowledge, the skill, the networks, and um, the previous work of the Ford Foundation and drill down in those regions uh, and see if we could create partnerships, find storytellers, and develop hubs uh, in those regions using already existing sort of networks and pathways that Ford Foundation in its social justice work across, you know, since 1950s in a lot of places has already developed. And so what we try to do um, is uh, work with the program officers in these offices understand what their local strategies were for helping storytellers and filmmakers in their region and the larger cultural uh, work that they were doing, and then match that with the funding that we had coming out of New York and our partners here. And, and we'll talk more about Doc Society, but Doc Society is here in the room, and Doc Society has been, I think, one of the main partners in all of this work actually over the last 10 years, and we'll get to reasons why that is. But what we did is actually created this network we took money that we had in the US, it was primarily domestic money that we were looking at, um, in the alternative public media system, so it's the public media system that's providing alternative content to public media, but increasingly to other outlets, commercial outlets as well, um, and moved that money to um, organizations like Duck Society and IDFA in Amsterdam that are looking specifically at working in the Global South and then began developing um, nodes and resources in the Global South, which is where we took the rest of this $20 million over the course of five years and invested it. But we invested it simultaneously as a linked network um, because we felt that that conversation um, will strengthen each other's practice and will inform each other's practice, both at the level of the artists, but also at the level of the organization. So we see the first Afro-Brazilian uh, organization that has come up because of a program officer out of Brazil supporting them over the last 10 years. Um, the Afro-Brazilian population um, in Brazil is 53% of the population. They had no network uh, for Afro-Brazilian filmmakers and producers until this year. It took that long. I mean, they, it, it's astonishing to me. Um, so we've been able to lift up those artists. We just brought them to Sundance to introduce them to Sundance, uh, and they will be part of this network as well. The same thing happened in Docs in, um, in Jakarta, working with Southeast Asian filmmakers for the last 10 years. Our program officer out of Jakarta, the Ford Foundation program officer, was working with that leadership, working with those young leaders, mainly filmmakers who have decided to build infrastructure that they didn't have. Um, and supported them, then New York started funding them, brought them into this network, and now they are a very strong part of this network. We saw the same thing in East Africa, in Nairobi, uh, two young artist leaders coming up, again, building infrastructure and building a network that they didn't have, really supporting them and fast-tracking them in a way. 
um, so that they could develop their own leadership more quickly. Um, and so all of these are very entrepreneurial activities run by filmmakers and artists. And in particular in Nairobi, in Indox, uh, uh, in, in Indonesia, in Nairobi, and in other places in the world, Doc Society has been one of the most important partners actually going in and working with leadership there, mentoring, but specifically with the notion of leaving behind knowledge, not staying, teaching, and then withdrawing, but actually transferring knowledge and skills and connections and making an exchange. Um, you know, with the um, creatives that are working, the creative people that are working in those regions that intend to stay in those regions, and that is hugely important in this equation. And so, if you can imagine this as a, it's a um, circulation of artists and ideas globally, an exchange of artists and ideas globally, and the whole notion is to understand from the filmmaker perspective, what is their experience coming up, say, as a Sri Lankan filmmaker? who is making an incredible film, needs a little bit of support, might get it from Indox. Indox takes them to a workshop. The workshop actually gets invited to a CAN workshop. The CAN workshop, you meet at Sundance. You go to a workshop at Sundance, then you get uh, access to grant funding. Slowly but surely, across all of these resources, they begin to work together to create um, the careers of these filmmakers in a really powerful way. Um, so this is, this is where we're at right now. This is, what we've, this is what we've just launched with all of these partners and we're just beginning discussions to understand what is possible with a network like this beyond supporting the individual films and their trajectories, their impact traje trajectories. So these are the organizations um, that we're working with. I won't go through all of them, but suffice it to say that these are all organizations that have, um, usually have regrant funds, they have training programs, their focus is on the independent filmmaker, um, and they have a very strong focus and an analysis of Global North or developing country and uh, supporting artists that don't normally uh, get the kind of support that we want to see. So we're very much geared toward bringing up new voices and new communities. There's a second level though. Um, that is just the, the funding that we had. This is a second level and there's even a third level. There are other organizations that are part of this network um, that we're also trying to support or others are trying to support that are also working local locally and are finding ways to bring these voices and visions to more people. So if you think of a group like Ambulante, does, if anybody knows Ambulante here, well Mark is in the back actually, has worked with them. Um, Ambulante actually takes uh, documentaries to rural communities that don't normally have access to these kinds of stories and they travel with the filmmakers and they have the belief that if you tell these stories and you bring these stories to people, they will change the trajectory of their own decision making they'll, and they'll also feel reaffirmed in, in their own experience. And so they'll go, they have um, uh, traveling uh, festivals, pop-up festivals, they have a whole um, slate of uh, creative events that they do like bike races and all kinds of things that they organize that the community can get involved in. Cinex works in Taiwan and China. Witness is working around the world and they're at the, uh, around the world at the, in several locations at the nexus of human rights um, and video and, and filmic storytelling. Um, so you see that, that there's quite an extensive network of organizations that are supporting the independent voice, um, and I keep repeating that, and we'll get to why I think that why I think that's important. So I don't know if we want to pause, and um, we might want to show the Just Films trailer at this stage, um, which just gives you a sense. Well, you'll see it, and then I'll I'll explain what's next. <laughs> in Detroit, you're watching it live. These are houses that are never coming back. Repent, when it is, for the forgiveness of your sin. They keep saying, I, I, are you rich, are you poor, are you rich, are you poor? It's about the sanctity of human liberty and the cost of it if you want to take it. I know. Keep your head up. We just can't disappear. We just can't. Take a big kiss, go! 
If he's found guilty, it will break him. To stand up, to fight back, is just incredible. That is Just Films as it ha has it been, and we love it so much we're going to play it again. <laughs> but that's only half the story. Um, that's the storytellers and the stories, um, but that doesn't include the networks and the organization and the real infrastructure that keeps those stories and those storytellers alive and thriving, and that's actually what this is, and I'd say that's one of the big changes that, that uh, we've looked at with Just Films over the last couple of years really is actually putting, putting some of that resource into that architecture and that infrastructure and thinking about the combination of the two, how we can integrate the content fund with the infrastructure and the architecting of what is a global movement and why we think that's important and I, because so, I know we want to get to conversation here. There's a couple of trends that I just wanted to point out that I think are, are facing all of us. This is the first trend that is just increasing in you know, the past couple of years as you've experienced here in Europe and we've certainly experienced in the US. So this is um, a favorite scary sc slide. Um, this is the Freedom House decline in democracy. Um, this whole left hand of, of the chart uh, are the declines in democratic practice over the last year. This is the 2016 report. The gains are at the bottom, just a few gains, just a few countries with gains in democ democracy. Um, as rated by Freedom House. Um, and so um, <laughs> this is really an astonishing, there are lots of ways to look at this, but what we do see in this backsliding of democracy is it hits um, around individual rights, around free expression, around creative expression, around any efforts uh, to really achieve some kind of power, uh, you know, in order to, um, uh, intervene in the kind of injustices that we're seeing. And when we see this kind of backsliding, and this is a 10-year backslide, um, you know, we, uh, I think the assumption, you know, um, over the last few decades has been that democracy um, would win out. Um, and I think people have been surprised to see this kind of backsliding. Um, and we've seen this wave move around the world from India to Indonesia. Uh, we've seen Trump, we've seen Brexit here. Um, we've seen it in Central Europe. So um, this I think is really important because the kinds of stories that are told by the kinds of storytellers that we're talking about here are in a way um, kind of stand against this backslide. They're one of the places where you can not only see resistance to this, but transformation of this. How, do, how can we see into a new future and how can we galvanize large communities into seeing that future and agreeing um, or moving in that direction? It's not that everybody has to agree on everything, but um, people do need to see connectedness around an agreement that injustice is unsustainable, for instance, or inequality in the case of Ford Foundation is actually not sustainable. Um, so that is the first very large trend that we've seen. And then the second is the technological advances that are transforming society faster than it can adapt. Um, and I think one of the, you know, the things that people have been talking about a lot is the, for instance, the filter bubbles um, that we're seeing. What, what happens when you have a Facebook and a Twitter world um, where you're creating your own streams of information and you're not really moving outside of them? That's just one level of this technological advances, and there are people in this room that know, you know quite a bit about this, actually, so in discussion we can talk about this. Um, and in this I include not only tech-enabled storytelling, but also things like artificial intelligence, the way in which our entire societies are gonna be transformed or are being transformed through um, the application of these new technologies. Um, and these are things that, that we have to, um, I think, address as we're beginning to develop the strategies moving forward around storytelling. Well, let's see. So um, one of the things, so we've done two things. We've talked about moving to a more global uh, strategy and thinking in terms of not everywhere around the world, but at least a globally linked strategy. 
um, with the um, knowledge that there's a commonality in storytellers everywhere in the world that seek to tell true stories about the conditions of their lives. This is something that we see everywhere. Uh, and these things can be, these, these stories, these voices, these talents can be naturally connected to each other. And that's one of the things that we want to uh, do with this global, with this approach, this global approach that we have. Making a new reality um, is uh, the beginning of a response to the fact of emerging media um, as a new moving image storytelling space. Uh, so making a new reality is a very large <laughs> landscaping report that we've done that is now being published on Immerse that is looking at these spaces and looking at places of intervention for social justice philanthropy in this new storytelling space. And we actually see a lot of our documentary artists um, moving into virtual reality or thinking about um, uh, augmented reality, thinking about hybrid forms of storytelling. And so we see that this, we follow our artists, we see that this is gonna be the case. And so we need to understand this space a little bit better. Um, so let me see where we wanted to leave here. So the emerging media piece and the global piece are the two um, new directions that we've gone into, new focus. Let's see, we are now moving backwards. I just wanted to show you, go to some of the storytellers, Jahan Nujam. So these are, these are the bulwark against these trends that I'm talking to you about. These are the people that sort of stand with their stories and, and <laughs> go to places in the world that the rest of us don't go and do very courageous and brave things. Um, and so I'll just flash through some of these, Stanley Nelson, Lourdes Portillo, uh, Emil D'Antonio, uh, Paco Donis and Pamela Yates, Harun Faruqi, Mark Silver, Yancey Ford. Um, I wanna stop with Yancey um, and show you two more clips and then we can go to discussion. Is that all right, Stefan? Yep. So um, uh, Yancey, actually we're going to skip the first clip and go to straight to the Strong Island clip, if that's all right. Um, so I show you these artists because most of these artists have been working for decades. They've been building careers, they have a thesis about the world, they continually investigate it. They use their contacts to build on other contacts, to build on new networks as they keep exploring, um, as they keep exploring um, the topics. Let's see, we'll pause it just for a second and then I'll introduce it. As they keep exploring topics. Now in the case of somebody like Yancey, Yancey took 10 years to make this film. This film was and is Yancey's life. Uh, and you will find filmmakers, very, very important transformative filmmakers ma where the film is the life, is the film is the life. And I wanted to pull out examples. Most of these filmmakers are examples of that kind of filmmaker where they are really deep, so deeply embedded in the story that they're telling. It's so important that actually it is in itself transformative and Strong Island is an example of that kind of story and storyteller. Um, and the other example I was going to bring up is Laura Poitras, uh, another example of that kind of story and storytelling, storyteller. So if we can show Strong Island, the clip of Strong Island, this is now uh, nominated for an Academy Award in this round. Um, and just an extraordinary story, totally unique. stumble out of the garage and into the yard where you fall. You lie on the ground, hole in your chest, another in your lung. You wonder how your family will survive this. You realize that you will not survive this. You can't speak, and no one speaks to you. You do not know that we are silent in our grief, even with one another. You do not know your killer will say he had to shoot you. You do not know your killer will make you out to be a monster. You do not realize that there will be no trial. You don't know that 23 white people will decide 
no crime has even been committed. William turned and was shot. That was the beginning. So we will see what happens with that film in terms of the Academy Awards, but uh, it has won, it has already won a, a tremendous number of awards uh, and support, but it, it's, um, it's one of these epoch defining films, I think. Uh, it takes you through an entire history of being black in America through the eyes and experience of one person. Um, this is his first film. Uh, he worked in the film world before this um, and developed the vision and the vocabulary working with a team of um, very creative producers, editors, etc. And, uh, and it's an extraordinary feat and it's the kind of thing that wouldn't happen without the kind of support that uh, private philanthropy puts into um, this space. Just a couple more things and then I think we can go to conversation. Um, there's a great Yo-Yo Ma quote um, that I was just listening to where he talks about how, you know, if politics is about building power, culture is about building trust. And trust is the foundation for any kind of social activity, any kind of civil civilizational activity. And so when we see cultural work, cultural expression as that foundational piece that the, without which we really can't accomplish anything, that's where I believe the power of uh, this kind of storytelling is. Then coupled with that, I think that the fact that it's outside the marketplace, the fact that, that it's, a, a, it's a response to a market failure, um, this independent film movement, um, that's very important to keep in mind because you can't develop a vision like this. You can't develop a career like Laura Poitras's if you're trying to work in response to the marketplace. <laughs> You have to be working and able to survive and live and, and create in response to the social conditions, to the human conditions, not the marketplace condition. And this is why you know, I've, I've always made the choice to be outside the marketplace in that sense, to feed the marketplace if that happens, but that's never the prerequisite. Um, what I have found though is with artists like this, the power of their work, the market actually bends toward them um, as opposed to the work trying to fit into the marketplace. So that's another, I think, final learning that I would offer um, working in this space and working, as I've said, with, with many, um, many incredible partners. Some of them are in this room right here. So I'll leave with that. I have an end piece that's on the horizon, but let's talk for a minute because I've gone through a lot. So first, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's, it's hard not to be moved and impressed, and I have about 100 questions. Um, but I'm going to limit myself to one, s which is your cue to start thinking about your perfectly honed question. You mentioned two or three times during your conversation tonight, um, you said independent. Mm. Then you said it's very important, this, this notion that it's independent. And then you said I'm going to come back mm. to the idea of independent. So I'm going to ask you to come back to it and tell us why you underlined it two or three times mm. during the talk. Yeah, I was thinking about it, so thank you for that question. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about how it being independent gets you in a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, uh, the notion of independence is something that I actually think that, that social entrepreneurs also feel, that they uh, don't, want to, don't want to answer to existing constraints, as particularly if they feel that they're ineffective. They want to invent new rules. <laughs> and I, I think that the notion of being independent is primarily in terms of the marketplace. That was the kind of coming back to, um, independent of the marketplace. I mean, the, the independent movement in the US was a critique of commercial media um, and a, a creating of space to operate outside of that. Um, but I think that, that, um, that we lose sight of the importance of that. So, so, so that, that's. So how do you square independence at, at the, at the, on, the, on the side of the artist mm -hmm. with um, distribution mechanisms mm -hmm. that are increasingly anything but independent, even if they are free. Right. Well, I think that that is um, part of the magic of some of these bridging institutions. So just films I consider to be a bridging, you know, a bridging um, uh, effort, uh, initiative. Sundance Institute is a bridging kind of initiative between marketplace and independent authored voice. 
Um, and they do have the effect of actually changing how the marketplace functions. And so um, we have new opportunities, for instance, in documentary with the Netflixes and the Amazons, some of the digital players um, that are actually buying things like this kind of very you know, work innovative. work against independence, presumably. Well, they don't necessarily work against independence. They're absorbing independence. So the question is, what's the balance between the absorption right, and the sanctuary? I mean, always creating, moving the space so that there's always a space um, that is well, as well supported as possible that's allowing for these voices so that the market actually, in a way, can find them. But we never want to rely on the marketplace, or at least I never want to rely on the marketplace to sustain and support, because the marketplace is arbitrary. It will move around. Uh, you know, the, the classic example of that is when Oprah came to Sundance and spent you know, a good part of a Sundance talking about how the book club was going to change the documentary field and how they were going to change everything for documentarians and everybody thought you know, the, o ch you know, the channel would be fantastic and I think within a year and a half it had completely uh, gone by the wayside and so we didn't see uh, the kind of support, we didn't see the resources coming from that particular um, entity even though I think her heart was in the right place. I think she meant it, but the marketplace didn't allow for it. So I'm not going to ask you about her in 2020. Instead, <laughs> instead I'm going to go and ask you to ask us questions, or rather to ask Clara questions. Um, as usual, could you tell us who you are, please, and wait for the microphone to arrive. Yes. Hi, I'm a social innovation and entrepreneurship master student at LSE. My question is, piggybacking on that, uh, do you ever see yourselves and your organization empowering and funding uh, videos and storytellers on YouTube and on Twitter and on Periscope? Because those are stories that need to be told and need to be heard as well. My other question is that, do you ever get f negative feedback? One question, you only have one. <laughs> you can pass your question to the yeah, person you next to you. you can, yeah. Negative feedback. Um, no, we haven't, done, we haven't done sort of um, crowdsourced or um, crowdsourced video, we haven't funded that at this stage, and that's primarily a question of resource. I, I think that it is a really important space, I think particularly for um, generations below 35, it is the space to be. Um, I know that's true with my kids. Um, and I think the question for us is how, within a, a, a strategy with limited resources, how do we support the, the how do we support as much as possible? And that is something that, that we haven't been able to find a way to doing. Um, I think film schools are another place, film festivals are another place, um, you know, crowdsource, citizen journalism is another thing that's not supported. And these are all really vital, I think, trends. Um, and um, and I, I certainly think that they're very important in the world, but they're not anything that we've been able to um, resource at this point. Hi, I'm also from Social Innovation Masters. Um, my name is Luisa, and I want to know if you somehow measure the impact of the film versus the investment? Um. That's a great question. Um, and we do that through standard quantitative, um, you know, quantitative impact, you know, how many people saw it, how many, you know, how, many, how much publicity did you get, you know, uh, how many ticket sales, et cetera. Um, I think that one of the things that we have to do better is thinking about how we measure sort of trust building and community, for instance. What's the, what's the measurement of strong community fiber? and how, does, how do cultural strategies fit into that? Um, what's the measurement of knowledge transfer? How do we understand how a topic, how people understand a topic has changed over time? And these are the kinds of things that I think that we can get some data on now. Well, I know we can get some data on it now, but we haven't come up with a, a sort of a template for reporting on that in terms of impact in a way that I would like to see um, to make it ex you know, very clear how it is that, that cultural strategies and social strengthening actually move together and trust building, and then the importance of that in you know, political, economic, et cetera, planning and strategy. Me? Yeah. 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 Also yeah. in the social innovation program, sorry oh. for the redundancy, <laughs> uh, but I wonder how you reconcile the urgency and ferocity of the world's needs and problems with a 10-year production cycle <coughs> or a 7-year production cycle and how you're able to prove that impact when many of the problems that you're talking about may have either gone by the wayside or changed completely over that time. 
Great question. Um, and I think the portfolio approach is one answer to that. In other words, we don't just fund 10-year projects. We also fund projects that are quite tactically you know, ready to go out in the world. Um, but the other thing that I would say is that many of the issues and the stories that we're, that we're talking about in terms of a social justice agenda and a creativity agenda are stories, they're, they're issues that, that aren't going to go away. Um, you know, there are issues like gender inequality, you know, racism, racial inequality, um, uh, economic inequality. These are things that are ongoing struggles in any society. And so you can imagine a story like Yancey's story. Um, yes, it took seven or ten years to get out, but it is even more relevant today than it was when, first of all, when it, I mean, obviously very relevant in the 90s when it actually happened. But when he started the film, um, it, we could not have imagined a world in which this film would be as resonant as it is right now, even though the event itself took place, you know, decades ago. So I guess that's how I would answer that. So we have a number of things that are going out in the world, you know, on a regular basis, and that's part of thinking about scale: is that you want to have some dozens of projects, you know. Um, that are moving in the world in different ways, and, and you, but you don't want to forsake the ones that take longer than anybody thinks, because those can sometimes be the most transformational stories. That's a great answer for that. Hey. Hi, uh, I'm from the Master in Public Administration, and my question relates to the others. Um, from your experience, um, besides providing a, a platform from creative expression or, or freedom of expression, um, do you have data or what's your experience on how this awareness that is being created transforms a uh, decision making or the way policy is being made? Um. So we do on one, you know, a film affects a policy. We have stories and case studies and in fact Doc Society, which is sitting, you know, they're here in the house can actually speak to that because they've done a series of really phenomenal reports that are actually case studies on precisely that. In fact, they ran the Impact Award to highlight uh, uh, exactly that, how it is that a particular film raises awareness and moves people to take action, you know, uh, take action around a particular policy. So uh, yes, what we don't have is uh, a lot of data and a, and a way of kind of rolling that up into an effect that we can count on. In other words, we can't say this is the exactly the kind of story that you need to tell and it will make exactly this kind of change in the world and here's how we have to target it. That's much more, you know, on the communications and messaging side. We haven't done that um, uh, partially, I think, because of resources. We, we don't have as many films that have done that in the world where we've been able to study them, long form creative documentary films. But um, I think we need to because the, the effects are much longer lasting, I think, in terms of changing people's hearts and minds. Um, in the policy realm, uh, so I think there's a great, I think there's kind of a brave new world there that, that we need to be resourcing and thinking about. Just before we come to the next question, I'm just wondering if anyone from Doc Society wants to, yeah. wants to, wants to comment at this point, just on that, on that question or, or more generally. Yeah, the question of um, measuring the impact of films is a fascinating and important one. Um, we're quite resistant to the idea of one measure. The Gates Foundation spent some time trying to bring in one measure. The Participant uh, Index was another attempt because actually films often are creating change in really different ways. And creating policy change is one of the easiest to track. Um, but changing kind of broad attitudinal attitudes or making a difference to communities. Um, so we're, we're for a much more bespoke um, approach to, to impact measurement that really uh, looks what each film is trying to trying to do in its kind of its own way, mm -hmm. but we see it all. I mean, the thing is, we we know it works, right? I mean, you see it happening right now in this country. The huge kind of attention that um, the BBC's uh, uh, Blue Oceans, no, Blue, Blue, yeah, Blue Planet has brought to plastics. You see how this triggers, you know, people at every level, consumer level, political level. But yeah, maybe someone will build us the big data machine. But also, we we can see it all around us. We can see how attitudes to um, to gay life and gay marriage uh, being passed, you know, oh so much to the cultural work that was done in storytelling and the first gay kiss on British television at Brookside. I mean, we know in our, in our, in our hearts as, as cultural beings that this is kind of how we operate. So yes, we want to learn more, but I also don't want to sit around saying we don't have legitimacy to do what we do until some data scientist can kind of like find some way to prove it because we absolutely know, know in our bones this is how society functions. Mm -hmm. 
Could you go right behind? There, is a, there was a question queued up. Hi, Kara. Uh, my name is Dheera Jakolkar. I'm a filmmaker. And uh, my quest I'm really glad that I'm asking this question after all these answers have been given. Because uh, right in the first production meeting, we discussed how can we change something. Mm -hmm. Because we realized at the end of the filming, everybody's so tired that to start changing something becomes very difficult. Mm -hmm. Fortunately for the film that I'm working on, we managed to finance both the outreach and the film, mm -hmm. and we are at the tail end. My question to you is that given the vast amount of experience that you have and the network and the experts, uh, films that are ready but don't have enough advice or enough guidance, mm -hmm. do they have space or place in just films or mm -hmm. in your scheme of things? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, this, uh, this is part of the, the network that I was talking about, the, the creating of um, allied organizations who all have the intention of working with filmmakers and supporting them. And this is actually a great segue to the next slide, which is On the Horizon for Social Justice Philanthropy. Um, this, the first slide, is exactly what you're talking about. So um, Good Pitch, and now Good Pitch Local, is exactly the kind, and it's a doc society, you know, project, and it was conceived of as precisely that place to move projects from um, aspiration and potential to implementation, to actually being able to achieve the vision that you might have. In particular, not just the creative side, but also the creative in light of the potential change that it could make in the world. And this was a real um, a shift, I think, to have an organization that that. Um, works with filmmakers and can bring them up both on the creative side and the impact side. I think the traditional model was much more, or I know the traditional model was much more thinking about how the story could be best told. But to actually combine that with the change that can be made, I think is the heart of the new future. It's the new, it's the question that we're asking and that is taking us to this, you know, beyond the new horizons. And within that, having those discussions where, where the filmmakers and the entire team, and not only the team, but the community that is involved with the story, right? So it's story source, story maker, story facilitator, story resourcer, right? All together thinking about the change that can be made in the world because of the story that's being, that's being told and supported is that much more holistic, I think, approach um, to storytelling that we, need to s that we need to be supporting if we have um, urgent, urgent challenges in the world as we do right now. So the good pitch model, which has been, you know, incubating and is, you know, somewhat mature in, in its 10 years and is so mature, in fact, that they've actually spun off good pitch local in the U.S. So they've gone from, you know, working globally around the world to really thinking about how to work locally um, and bind together movement makers and movement resources to be much more targeted in terms of the storytelling and much more elastic in terms of the types of stories that can be supported and tactical. So that, that back to your question, uh, over here you can actually be doing short-term strategy and campaigns with creative storytelling and long-term campaigns. And they're really sitting right in the realm of the, the knowledge and the networks that movements and movement builders are, are creating. And this is a fascinating, not fascinating, it's an extremely ins important and rich space right now. Um, that we're looking at um, in particular with uh, Doc Society and the Good Pitch model. I just wanted to point out a couple of other things that we're supporting out of Just Films, which is this sort of new constellation of, of narrative support and cultural, uh, cultural um, shift resource. So the Pop Culture Collaborative, you can look this up. They've just launched this year and they're doing fantastic work bridging industry to independence to movements. Um, to narrative, to, nar to understanding how narrative works, how larger narratives work. Um, and this organization right now is funded for five years uh, on a trajectory to really redefine the American narrative in particular. So it's a domestic to America at this point, though I think um, because so much of the U.S. industry and storytelling moves overseas, we'll actually have a lot that's applicable in other places and spaces as well. Um, the Narrative Initiative is another initiative that's just been funded for 10 years. Um, and it is a training and resource for leaders, uh, particularly in movements, 
that are working towards justice that need to understand. So these are non-filmmakers and storytellers who are leaders of organizations or movements that want to understand how to work with narrative and culture shift strategies more effectively and more fluently. And so this is a new resource in this field in the last 18 months. Uh, and then a very local one that we've been working with um, uh, actually helped form is the um, Detroit Narrative Agency. DNA, um, which is in fact run by movement leaders who are also artists and creators. So it's one and the same person. Um, and there's a, there's a cohort of them that are working out of Detroit that, that we worked with to form the DNA and to actually create a community-based social justice network and hub in Detroit that is telling new stories of Detroit. So these are new ways of constituting, uh, you know, what we used to call a documentary fund that are really uh, much more targeted, much more thinking about the change that we can make, the difference that we can make in the world um, with our stories. And I think that's the, the you know, that, that is now, I think, the new horizon that, that we need to be working on. And, and social justice, not just one foundation, multiple foundations. Um, and donors, there, you know, resource needs to be put into this space, and it is starting to be. There's a tremendous amount of interest in this. Mm. That, that we bundle these questions together. I'll try to record them. I just want to make sure that we don't run out of time. Um, so and then I need two minutes at the end. One minute. One minute at the end so of this. So one, two, three, four. Okay. One. Oh, I didn't realize you had the mic. I'm sorry. Oh, that wasn't very efficient. <laughs> if, I'd oh, seen you <laughs> the, if I'd seen the mic, I would have counted differently. I apologize. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. Um, I want to ask kind of a, a broader question on the more general theme of of the overlap between philanthropy and, and, and film. And, and we talked about really positive examples of, of, of um, film being used to affect social change. Um, but I wanted to ask about where film perhaps has had a neg has sometimes a more negative impact and where some films, um, for instance, lots of films, um, when they depict the uh, problems, such as, problems such as poverty, actually end up being very pejorative and end up being very belittling. And I wondered how um, and I, I feel that a lot of um, film that is in the public um, image or in public discussion is actually not doing much good in presenting uh, really, and actually has negative externalities. And so I wanted to ask you a comment on how you ensure that these videos are really doing positive things. Okay, that's a great one. question. Mine's a bit more meta, I'm Joaquin. Um, <laughs> what happens if it gets worse, right? Because Trump, Brexit, the decline in democracy really challenges what philanthropy needs to consider um, and where the, where the lines in the sand are. So I guess more generally, what happens if we go further into the night here? Um, and for the innovation that you're bringing to this, it feels like everything's at stake for civil society. How do we elevate this work to, to disseminate across sectors that are not so concerned usually with media? Mm -hmm. One answer is we won't go quietly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Taggy Amirani, I'm a documentary maker who's crash crashed this party. Um, could you talk briefly, if possible, about the criteria for selection of films that Just Film supports, timelines, <laughs> how much, and how? Um, by the way, I'm working on my ninth year on the same project, almost entirely funded by philanthropy. Yes, great. Okay, and four. Okay, I can start. Um, so I'm a oh. uh, they want to record. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, so I'm a dual degree student from the Hurd School of Governance, mm. MPA student here at LSE. Mm. But I also have a background in theater. So I worked most more specifically with social justice the uh, theater. Ah. And my question is actually more related to one of the first comments that you made in terms of the creative industry sector, how the innovation is coming in terms of um, artificial inte intelligence and virtual reality. So what I was thinking is theater, for instance, has a very um, compacted impact because of the amount of people that it reaches. So in terms of the innovations in the sectors, I'm bringing that storytelling towards um, masses and mm -hmm. pop culture, which is showing the, the initiative. Um, how, where do you see the innovations coming and how do you see the impact changing mm -hmm. in terms of um, artificial intelligence and also the question of uh, virtual reality? Mm. Wow, okay. Okay, that's four questions. We're not doing any one of we're not ignoring anyone. Okay, the, the four questions are, films can have unintended negative impact. Discuss. Um, <laughs> what about if the world gets worse? Discuss. Discuss. Um, what are your selection criteria for um, supporting things? 
and what specifically are the kinds of innovations that you anticipate in AI and VR? Mm, Just great. small questions. So <laughs> you, <but> you, <laughs> should be you all went meta. These. You all went meta. We need help. Um, well, I will say that, um, that there are people in the audience that know as much or more about some of these questions, so people can dive in. But uh, the negative effects, I think that, that we think a lot about um, frameworks uh, in terms of the, the storytellers that, that we fund. And yes, we know that you know, film can be extremely effective as propaganda, um, as well as, uh, you know, sort of storytelling that lifts up a more humanistic, uh, more complex and nuanced uh, kind of way into uh, another's reality. And so in our choices, we look for framing and for storytelling that does the second and, and avoids the first, but that's not to say that there is a tremendous amount of money and resource going into the kinds of films that you're talking about that have a negative consequence, and, and it's actually not just films, it's a whole mode of reporting that is very much about headlines and drama and fear, and et cetera. I mean, very, very recently we had a documentary filmmaker named Steve Bannon in the White House, and it's quite extraordinary. We didn't actually think that the power of documentary was going to show up in Steve Bannon sitting next to Donald Trump in the White House in the United States. That's not on any, that wasn't on any of our, you know, kind of uh, radars. But it does tell you that that, that kind of storytelling, that this, this idea of telling true stories about the world is incredibly powerful and can be used against its, you know, its best ends. Um, so it's our, you know, we, we, we look very carefully for the kinds of stories that don't do that. That's all, that's all I can say about how we support it. But we do that with the knowledge that it can have you know, a very different kind of agenda. And you know, it's usually governments that, uh, uh, or corporate um, you know, entities that, that use it for those ends, which is to say that it tells falsehoods or makes you believe um, that things are, are not what they really are. Um, what happens if it gets worse? I think it will get worse. And one of the reasons that, that, or it is getting worse, and one of the reasons that this sector is so important is precisely because it's not as easily controlled. It is decentralized. Uh, it is, um, and it's also the result of a fundamental human need to express, so it's not going away. It's a question of how can it be resourced, safeguarded, located, um, and then distributed. And I think we have to be very creative in the future about how we do that. And it's not going to be in the institutions that were invented previously. It's gonna be in other, other communal forums, perhaps. It's gonna be, and, well, and you're the first to know this, it's gonna be you know, using the, um, digital infrastructure in different ways. Um, uh, so those are just the beginnings. Uh, I, but I will say that it's not going to be centralized um, and it, and it, to be effective. And, and that is going to be a sort of uh, one place that we're going to see um, some critique or some analysis or some commentary or some truth telling that's, you know, that's much needed in the world. Um, the um, question of how we select, I can talk to you later. It's on the website. Um, so I, I don't want to go through all the details uh, of it, but it's easily accessible to everybody on the Just Films website if you're, if you're curious about how we select and how we choose. Um, I will say, though, that we are trying to, obviously, the, the, the DNA is still long-form, fact-based storytelling, uh, but we are working our way out from that and trying to bring in other donors and foundations to resource this um, because we can't do it alone anymore. Um, there's just too much need, too much potential, um, and uh, too much possibility in this space right now for one foundation to actually be able to support it all. In fact, that's never been the case. It's just that Ford was one of the only foundations doing it. Uh, the good news is that I think we are seeing a lot of traction with other foundations now and donors um, and other resources. Um, the question of VR and AI is such a complicated one. I hate to dive in and give you know, the very superficial answer that I'm about to give. <laughs> but I think that the critique, one of the critiques of VR right now is that it is not accessible, that it, it is very rarefied. I think that that will, I think the accessibility question will be solved relatively quickly. And I think that the gaming, you know, the, the sort of gaming uh, structures that, that we see, um, the corporate structures are gonna be one way. Um, and, but I think that, that gaming is actually gonna be telling the kinds of stories that, that are not the nuanced stories, that are the black and white sort of, uh, uh, binary stories, you know, that kind of cut everything into good, bad, you know, male, female, et cetera, et cetera, that have gotten us into so much trouble. Um, but I do think that um, we are going to see affordable technology um, in the next few years. 
Um, the AI question is much more complicated, and AI, when I was mentioning it, artificial intelligence is really going to be applicable across every single sector, not just the storytelling sector, but I think broadly speaking that you'll be able to see um, people using um, 360 storytelling with augmented reality and embodied space, right? With an AI enabled program that actually learns with you so the story changes and the environment changes and even the uh, people that you participate with become a learning community in a way or a storytelling community or an experiential game community. Um, in the future and you're going to be in situations where that reality is going to feel very much like this reality. You're going to maybe know that it's different, but it may not be less important. Um, that's how effective I think that these technologies are going to be. Um, so it's a really uh, quite unimaginable new world at this stage. Or those folks that are imagining it are just seeing the beginnings of what I think might be what we're going to be seeing, you know, within our lifetime, within my lifetime, which is going to be hopefully shorter than your lifetime. You're going to see much more of it than, than I am. Thank you. Do you want a final word? I do have I a final word. Okay. Yes, I do have a final word. I thought in honor of the last lecture of the series, Stefan, I brought you two gifts. And you get to choose which one you believe your, your suits your mood. The first gift is the essential Rumi, who we, the poet that we go to when times are tough. Yeah. Very tough indeed. Um, and the second is, it's even worse than you think. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the new book that David K. Johnston just uh, was talking about that I ordered swiftly and decided to bring to you. It's what the Trump administration is doing to America. Which would you like to take with you, <laughs> Stefan? Well, I'm feeling <laughs> rather more self-flagellating than I am um, um, Spiritual, so I'm going to go for the Johnson. You're going to go for Donald Trump. Well, good, then I, I had a poem picked out to read okay. to, to close the, uh, it's a very short Rumi poem, and sometimes I, sometimes I feel like this character I'm about to read about. W or would you like to read it? No, no, you read it. All right, this is the lame goat. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen a herd of goats going down to the water. The lame and dreamy goat brings up the rear. There are worried faces about that one, but now they're laughing because look, as they return, that goat is leading. There are many different kinds of knowing. The lame goat's kind uh, is a branch that traces back to the roots of presence. Learn from the lame goat and lead the herd home. Sometimes I feel like that's, that's our role. Well, thank you. I don't know what to say except that it is my job to lead the herd <laughs> home. Um, so I'm going to end simply by offering you my heartfelt thanks and our heartfelt thanks. Um, I've learned a lot tonight and I think we all have. I was particularly struck by a couple of things. I was very much struck by your answer to your question when you asked, well, how can this make a difference on a 10-year horizon. It's always wise to resist binaries. Problems don't go away, they mutate. Solutions are never absolute, mm -hmm. they mutate. And I think if ever there were an instance of, of that wisdom, it's the work that you do and the work that you support. Um, and just as I think somebody else, it might have been Jess, somebody else said, there isn't an algorithm for social mm -hmm. justice. It doesn't mean we shouldn't measure things, it's just there isn't an algorithm um, uh, um, uh, or, a, or, a, or a numerical solution. And I think that's, a, that's a, an insight that's been echoed across this, um, uh, across this series. Um, so thank you too for your interesting, informed, generous questions. Um, thank you again for making the trip to um, the LSE. This is the final lecture, so I have nothing to present to you next Tuesday, um, except a plea to send us an email or fill in a form uh, or indicate to us whether this is a powerful thing in your lives, whether it's an incidental thing in your lives, how you might wish to carry on the conversation with us during your LSE careers and beyond, and how you might wish this to be shaped for next year, since we're not here for our amusement. Uh, we're here for your amusement. Thank you all very much. <laughs> and thank you.